Hello and welcome to another edition of TPA Talks. Joining me this week is Robin Aitken. Uh, Robin is a veteran journalist at the BBC who worked there for 25 years. Um, he's published numerous books looking at its biases and lack of impartiality as he perceives them. Um, he's been publishing numerous uh, uh, publications such as The Telegraph, Spectator uh, and Unheard as well. So uh, let's get cracking and start uh, talking to Robin. Well, Robin, thank you very much indeed for uh, for joining us in uh, today's TPA talks. Uh, I think probably probably best to start off with um, just reflection on your on your time at the BBC. I mean, how did you how did you find the culture? Did it evolve somewhat in your in your twenty five years there, or did you sort of sense a kind of um, uh, innate uh, bias or biases when you were when you were working there? Um, well, firstly, thanks for asking me, Duncan. Um, well. I think like most people who, I joined the BBC as a young man um, back in the 1970s, so I was in my 20s. And I was um, proud to join the BBC. I felt that uh, I was joining the best broadcaster in the world. Best because it had this reputation for honesty and fairness and impartiality. Um, uh, and um, I settled into the BBC and began to find my feet. But within, I suppose, about 10 years, I began to have doubts about it. Um, doubts about the, the impartiality doctrine, which is embedded in the BBC's culture. So, as you know, you know the BBC's um, pitch is that it offers a service which is free from bias, um, which is fair to all sides of an argument, um, and which, in which all voices are heard. And actually, that's far from the truth. And it became um, very clear to me during the 1980s. Um, I was working part of that time in Scotland, and then I moved to London. Uh, I joined the Money Program. Um, and um, it became very clear to me that there was this real animus against Mrs. Thatcher and against what came to be known as Thatcherism. So the idea of market economics, um, economics driven by um, the sense of what was affordable and what was pragmatic was very much resented by the BBC. And um, from that moment onwards, or from those years onwards, I suppose, um, my misgivings about the, the real nature of the BBC grew and, um, and came to embrace many other aspects of um, political debate and political culture. A, a lot of staff at sort of various levels of the organisation, they, are they sort of quite cognizant in terms of um, you know, this, is a, this is sort of an inbuilt bias which is perpetuated or um, were there quite a few people, either you know, fellow, fellow graduates, new joiners <clears throat> back in the 70s or subsequent to that who um, had a similar kind of realization. Uh, is there sort of a balance between the two, or do sort of people realize very quickly that that is indeed, <clears throat> from an editorial position, sort of a very consistent thing with the BBC, um, or there's a sort of slower realization with that? Well, um, a friend of mine, um, a man I used to <clears throat> as editor, Rod Little, um, who you might know of or know, um, Rod takes the view that, um, and I agree with him actually, that. Um, what you're looking at in the BBC is a political culture which doesn't recognize that it is itself political. So um, if you take an issue like Brexit, for instance, um, it seems so self-evident to the BBC, to BBC staff, that Brexit is a bad idea, that um, in this intellectual bubble, if you like, in which they, they exist, a sort of groupthink emerges, which um, it, inside which they cannot see their own bias. So um, on the Brexit issue, uh, they were, I mean, it was another of the issues which really triggered my skepticism about the BBC, was the way in which uh, the BBC 
treated with the idea of Euroscepticism going back to the 1990s. So this was before the emergence of UKIP. But I was interested in the in the topic um, for various reasons. I just thought it was an interesting political topic. And um, I knew various people who were uh, passionate about the subject and I became interested in it myself. And the BBC's view of Euroscepticism, as it was then not known because the, the, the name hadn't been coined really, but um, was that anyone who wanted to leave the the, the EU or, or had doubts about the EU was was in some way not only wrong-headed but probably evil um, and certainly stupid. Um, so so the idea was that Euroscepticism was a kind of madness um, which the BBC simply didn't understand. And the, the, the problem about this, Duncan, is this, that um, if you start off from the position that your opponent's arguments are um, not worth considering. It militates against understanding. Um, so the, the reason that Brexit and the referendum came as such a nasty shock to the BBC was because it hadn't understood what the country felt about the EU. And the reason it hadn't understood was because it never occurred to it that uh, a majority of people out there could have a different view from itself because to itself, its own view was so self-evidently right and obvious that no other thought intruded. Mm. And I mean, th that in a nutshell is what happened uh, with B Brexit and the BBC. And I may say that it was exactly the same thing which happened in the Trump presidency. So the BBC's attitude to the Trump presidency was one of bewildered hostility. It didn't understand how Americans could have voted for this person, and it didn't care to find out what it was that had motivated millions of Americans to vote for Trump. They just didn't get it, and what's more, they were ill-equipped to find out. Mm -hmm. I, so for, for following, following with that, I mean, a lot of um, ideas have been floating around current government to move civil servants away from Whitehall um, for, for, I think, good good rationale, one of which is is cost, uh, another is a broader range of views, uh, less emphasis on, on, on graduates to fill civil service roles. I mean, that's all, that's, all, that's all good stuff. And obviously, the BBC went through quite a, quite a similar transformation circa 2011, 2010, <clears throat> when I think you know, a lot of, you know, the, the, the sport department and a few other elements, BBC sure. Breakfast moves up to Salford, just the west of um, just the west of Manchester. I wonder, with that, um, did you did you instinctively find that you know, quite, a, quite a bit of a PR gesture? You know, you can you can move some of these roles up to up to uh, Manchester from from White City or Broadcasting House, um, and indeed probably create some some new roles and, and Mancunians who who wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to work at the BBC. I mean, is that is that is your sense that sort of slightly window dressing or is that a, a genuine uh, good natured attempt to try and broaden the broaden the views in which editorial decisions or indeed anything else at the BBC is 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 determined? Um, well, the answer to that, I think, is, is is a bit of both. I do think that um, <laughs> the BBC you know, is full of people who are good hearted people and who sincerely believe that they're doing the right thing. And I don't doubt for a moment that uh, there is within the BBC, there are many executives within the BBC who would see uh, a natural advantage and a proper advantage in moving some of the jobs of the corporation up north. But the thing is that you can take an individual out of the metropolis, but you can't necessarily take the metropolis out of the individual. And what I mean by that is that, yes, it's true that Breakfast News was moved up to Salford Keys, but did it make a blind bit of difference to the tone of the coverage on something like Brexit, for instance? No, it did not. So you might have moved those jobs north by a couple of hundred miles, but you haven't shifted the attitudes of the people who produce the program. Um, so, so although it's... I agree with you, actually, that, that moving some of these highly paid and prestigious jobs to the northwest of England 
is in and of itself a good thing to do because why shouldn't you know not everybody if you want to work for the BBC, it shouldn't mean necessarily that you have to live in London. I mean, why should it? You know, that there ought to be jobs spread around the country. Of course, I, I take that as a given. But the, the, the problem with the BBC is that you have no real diversity of viewpoint within the programme making departments. Um, that actually what you have is a political monoculture, more or less, throughout the corporation. When it comes to big issues like Brexit or Trump or any number of social issues, um, there is a, you know, there is a predictability about what the BBC will think and believe and tell you about those issues. Mm. And I w wonder with, with that um, sort of perceived, perceived monoculture um, of opinion, I, uh, so reflecting on obviously our interests, the uh, uh, very much with the, with the license fee and the nature of how the how the BBC is funded, how it has always been funded. Do you think that's do you think that's sort of part of the issue in that uh, those who make such editorial decisions uh, in the BBC are sort of one step removed from commercial prep, uh, pressures, rather of competing against you know the the broad array of of options which are which are currently available, not least you know GB News, which 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 launched a, launched a few weeks back. I wonder. With with such diversity of, of of thoughts and options which are available, I mean, the license fee. Do you think that's actually sort of quite a big barrier to to allowing to allowing those currently in the BBC and those potentially uh, who could work in the BBC in the future to, to sort of move away from that from that monoculture? The BBC, the license fee can be you know argued against on, on on numerous grounds, but actually, is that sort of an accidental way to inculcate a single single way of perceiving issues? Um. Well, I'm glad you asked about the license fee because I think the license fee is the key to it all. Um, the you you have to go back to the you have to go back to the beginnings of the BBC. It's nearly a hundred years old now, the BBC, and you have to remember a number of things about the license fee. Um, the BBC was set up initially as a monopoly service. And the reason it was a monopoly was it was a natural monopoly, actually, because there was a scarcity of wavelengths and the wavelengths available for radio transmission in Europe were parceled up by treaty between the various European nations and uh, Britain got one a couple of wavelengths, but there was only room really for one station. So it was a natural monopoly. Um, the Lord Reith, um, and the, the initial executives at the BBC were very conscious of the fact that this was a powerful new medium and they were determined that it should be free from government interference. So it shouldn't become a state broadcaster. It should not be under the control of the government. So, uh, so arose the doctrine of independence of the BBC. And the license fee was seen as a way of guaranteeing that independence. So you had a fee, which was, is in effect a tax, but which the government has no control over itself. The money goes directly to the BBC. Everyone who uses the BBC has to buy a license. Now, it was also assumed that because the BBC is universally paid for, so everybody has to pay for the, for the, for the BBC through the license fee, it was assumed that because that was the mechanism, that would make the BBC responsive, as it were, to all its license fee payers. So because you paid the license fee, you had a right to be heard and the BBC would be cognizant of that. And so the BBC would be responsive to public mood. In fact, the exact opposite has happened. So what has happened is that the license fee has insulated the BBC from commercial pressures, has guaranteed its independence, which has allowed it to go entirely off on its own course. <laughs> so it is indeed independent. And what's more, it's unaccountable. Um, it has its own complaints procedure, which frankly is a farce, mm. uh, as anyone who's tried to use it will know. Um, it answers to nobody. It won't engage with critics like myself. You know, I've been banging on about the BBC. I've written books about it and so on and so forth over the past, um, 15 years or so. And what has happened? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> it doesn't engage with me. 
It doesn't engage with other critics because it doesn't need to, it doesn't have to. The, the license fee actually guarantees that the BBC can afford to be arrogant with its critics and arrogant with its audience because no one can touch it. It'll, it knows that it's going to get the money next year, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think the key to reforming the BBC now is to tackle the license fee issue. And I really do think that the moment is approaching when the government is going to have to put the BBC on notice that um, the license fees days are numbered and that a subscription service is the way to go. Mm -hmm. I, 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 as you say, there is a sort of a, a nominal independence and obviously the <clears throat> arrangements for the license fee that's determined on a sort of periodic basis between Department for Culture and um, trustees of the BBC over the years. So it's, it's a slightly curious one step removed, one, one step removed um, degree of independence. And I, I sort of noticed in recent years that a lot of the argument for the, for the maintenance of the, of, of the license fee, particularly with the growth of Amazon, Netflix, Disney and so forth, is that, well, actually, the offering that you get from the BBC of 150 odd pounds a year and the variety of channels. There's no other competitor which is able to offer that offer that kind of ability. I wonder if that if that argument is um, actually sort of quite viable for the BBC. I mean, if you kind of reflect on, you know, for example, the death of uh, the death of Prince Philip. I mean, um, you know, saw saw a fair, fair amount of that. I'm sure most most people watching saw, saw at least some of the BBC coverage um, after his death. And um, actually, I think that was very very sympathetically done. So I think there's still this. Yeah kind of innate ability of the BBC to um, well draw the nation together is a bit a bit cliche perhaps but nevertheless as as recourse to the national broadcaster it's still you know it's still quite triumphalist almost with its ability to do that and I wonder whether yes as in as much as the the sustainability and the, and the philosophical rationale for the license fee is, is certainly diminishing in recent years with the competitors the BBC I, I sense will always be able to sort of trumpet trumpet that that position of well actually you know we've always got um uh, us within the national psyche um for for, for, for a certain extent um well you make a, a very good point and of course the the thing is that um I think there are very few people in the country myself included, who have not enjoyed BBC programming, who do not value some of the services that it provides, um, the ability which it has, as you mentioned, to, on big occasions, to draw the nation together. Um, so these are all great strengths of the BBC. And it's also true, I think, that compared with what one would pay, for instance, to, um, to have uh, Sky News, Sky Sport, or um, to buy the services that you get from BBC for your 157 quid, um, to buy those on the open market would cost probably a lot more and you wouldn't necessarily be getting the same sort of quality. So that's all a great strength of the BBC. And I also think, you know, the at the start of the COVID crisis uh, last year, the BBC showed the strengths of public service broadcasting, the way it was able to disseminate quickly and um, accurately information that people needed to cope with this new disease. So it rediscovered, actually, at that time, the, the old virtues of public service broadcasting. But the problem is that the, the whole um, license fee idea, which is a great privilege, rests on the assumption that the BBC is genuinely impartial. And you, know, you should never lose sight of this fact, that we all have to pay for the BBC, and therefore we all have a right to expect that the BBC will take note of our views and reflect our views back to the nation. And that isn't what has been happening. And that is the real problem. If the BBC had been doing its job properly, if the credo of impartiality had been strictly adhered to over the past 25 years, there wouldn't be this problem about the BBC. Nobody would be talking about the BBC because mm. it would be recognized as what it is, a great national asset, a great treasure, and everyone would be happy. But people are not because they see that the BBC has let them down 
and has forsaken its uh, its attachment to impartiality. That's mm. the problem. Mm-hmm. I, I, well, I'm sort of following that through. I mean, uh, you know, obviously it's not responsive to to shareholders in the in the usual way. I and mean, there are you know various stakeholders, be it the the government which arranges the license fee, obviously all of us who. Pay for it, internal editorial decisions, the trustees, which are formerly the BBC governors as well. Um, I, I wonder, obviously, there should be changes to the licence fee in the future. But in the meantime, could there be, for example, changes with the corporate governance of the BBC now? I think there are sort of various representatives from the nations which would normally have a role on the on the board effectively to determine that. But I wondered if there's sort of a, 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 a sort of easy intermediary step that that comes to mind which might sort of nullify some of these some of these editorial concerns that you have no is the short answer yeah um uh, the bbc has been through a series of iterations with its governance so the blair government lost patience with the bbc after the um the imbroglio of uh, david kelly and arms you know the um weapons and mass destruction mm-hmm. And it forced on the BBC, now it was, what was this, 2008, I think. So 2008, I think the uh, the government abolished the governors who had been the previous um, governance of the BBC since its beginnings uh, and uh, replaced that with the so-called BBC Trust. That was a difference without a distinction as far as I could see and most others. Um, uh, the Cameron government abolished um, the trust and brought in um, an executive board um, and the executive board uh, is as far as I can see pretty much what the trust was and pretty much what the governors were. The problem here is this Duncan that that, um, as an individual BBC journalist or producer or editor um, your connection with the Board of Governors or the BBC Trust or the BBC's Executive Board is going to be absolutely minimal. Um, and um, there is no way that the, the current governing body of the BBC, this Executive Board, there is no way that can interfere on a direct basis with um, BBC output. Hmm. Um, now, they, they, what they have done and I applaud this, is that they have brought onto the board um, Robbie Gibb, Sir Robbie Gibb, I should say, who was a a senior political journalist at the BBC in charge of BBC Westminster. He then became um, Theresa May's uh, head of communications at Downing Street. He is a Tory, in other words, um, a man of the right, broadly speaking. And he's now been put on the board. Now, that's a very good thing for a number of reasons. One, he is of the right, and the BBC needs more people like that to try and correct the, the problem there is. Two, he he has been and was a very effective journalist himself, so he knows that of which he talks. You know, so that's a very good thing. He has the expertise, in other words, to to know what is going wrong at the BBC. But um, the the real the real answer to the problem the BBC has, I think. Is to um, is to create proper diversity in the workforce, and that would mean that they have to go out of their way um, to recruit people who are of a different mindset and espouse a different politics to that of the existing workforce. Now, how do you achieve that? Not so easy. I'm not sure how you do that. Actually, that's why. Mm. I've come to the conclusion that really what the BBC needs is a kick up the backside, and that would be delivered by ending the license fee and forcing it to move to a subscription Mm. uh, method. Because if you did that, I think, you see, what what that does immediately, it means the BBC has to fight for audience share to get its revenue. So it can no longer just rely on the passive collection of the license fee, getting its five billion pounds a year that way. It would have to actively seek out um, an audience and it would have to satisfy that audience to get their money. 
And that's a real, that would be a real pressure and a real change. And I think that would force change on the BBC. Mm -hmm. uh, no, obviously, obviously in agreement with uh, the very clear rationale the BBC's move to a subscription model uh, in the future. I mean, we've done numerous things looking at the BBC uh, in recent years, not least when their annual accounts were published last year. We you know, put together a BBC Rich List looking at various expenses and allowances for, for many of the senior staff. Specifically on that on that matter, um, this isn't unique to the BBC, of course. We see this across all areas of the public sector, you know, completely unnecessary foreign trips, uh, utilisation of business and first-class flights and so on and so forth, even if the guidance from various central government departments is really quite explicit that this really, really shouldn't be done. Um, I wonder, in terms of a, a, a reputational issue of the BBC, my sense is that a lot of, a lot of public concern is increasingly, increasingly to do with uh, many of the biases which you which you've identified previously um but i also sense that the bbc aren't exactly helping themselves when instances such as these obvious examples of waste happen time and time again i wonder sort of again reflecting on how how the license fee has accidentally impacted the 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 biases and the output and the non-impartiality of of um many who work there and the output for that do you think that's also also feeding into a, a very obvious culture of, of waste, which we and many others have, have identified over the years? Well, I do. And, uh, you know, these stories about um, corporate waste, you know, tens of thousands of pounds spent on taxis and so on, these things are very bad for the BBC's reputation. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm long in the tooth, obviously, and um, I go back to a time when, as a BBC employee in the 1970s and 80s, um, I wasn't particularly well paid, um, and neither was anybody else in the BBC at the time. In fact, Alistair Milne, when he was DG, he was Director General, and when he left his job, he was still being paid less than £80,000 a year, which was a decent salary in those days, but nothing fantastic. Um, the rot really set in, I'm afraid, in the 90s under Lord Burt, John Burt, um, and particularly under his successor, Mark Thompson. Um, and Thompson, who is a man who has many admirable qualities, but he did something which, to my mind, was unforgivable. I mean, he inflated the top tier of salaries at the BBC to a ridiculous level. He was himself getting £800,000 a year to be Director General of the BBC. Now, I think that turned public service into self-service, actually. And I hasten to add, I'm still at the BBC in those days. Um, those sorts of inflated salaries did not trickle down to my level. I mean, I was just an ordinary reporter, right? I was a, you know, I was a today reporter. Okay, it's a decent job. I loved the job, but I wasn't fantastically well paid. But I accepted that as being, um, you know, part of the, the trade-off was, I had the privilege of working for the BBC, therefore I wasn't too worried that I was getting paid less than I might have earned in the private mm. centre. Mm. But Thompson and his cohort of executives turned that on its head. And the, you know, the, uh, you know, when I used to go travelling as a reporter, the expenses were not particularly generous. There were plenty of other journalists working for other organisations who did better in terms of hotels and so on and so forth than BBC people did. But as I say, I never thought there was anything wrong with that. And I, I always, um, I just thought that it's public money and with public money, one should always be particularly careful because it's come out of the pockets of people who are very likely less well off than you are yourself, you know. So that money should be spent carefully. And the BBC has all too often lost sight of that. And things like the, you know, the salary paid to Gary Lineker, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but really, can that be justified uh, for, from licence fee payers' money? Do you know, I don't think it can. I think that that is um, a, that's an affront to license fee payers mm. and the BBC it seems to be it seems to be blind to the offense that that gives people and I really think that the you know this is an Achilles heel of as you say 
you know, it's not just the BBC we're talking about here. There are all sorts of examples in the public service of people wasting money um, and, and spending money on themselves. And it's all wrong, you know, and uh, but the BBC, you know, the, the, the point about the BBC at the moment is that it's facing it's facing a government which has um, has no reason to to be grateful to the BBC. You know, Boris and many Tories see the BBC partly as the enemy. Mm. And so the BBC has to watch its step. And every time that you get one of these stories where money is being wasted or spent on exorbitant salaries and so on, these things all add to the pressure on the BBC. I didn't know about the, sort of the, the upward trend in senior salaries at the BBC. And like, you sort of often when we do... Other publications of ours, not least the Town Hall Rich List, you know, we've had responses from council leaders of, well, well, it's a very competitive market, since therefore we need to attract a certain degree of talent. Um, now, it'd be very interesting to see how many former chief executives of local authorities are now sitting on the boards of 100 companies. Um, you know, it's just not, it's not a, it's not a ten tenable argument, as you say. I mean, the licence fee is basically a hypothecated tax, and so therefore you know, necessarily the, the, the market, the market for talent is different. And as you also allude to, I mean, it's, you know, those one assumes those who work for the BBC are doing it certainly out of slightly more, out of a sense of slightly more public spirited nature rather than rather than ITN and, and, and channel for other competitors. One, one assumes. So yes, that's that, that, that does seem a curious, curious change. Um, just to j just to finish up, I mean, obviously you've addressed you know, numerous issues, not least in um, the books that you've written over the years. Um, if it was to be the case that, you know, uh, this afternoon, Tim Davey stands down from on the BBC and uh, you're, you're, you're put into the director general role, Robin, what, what two or three changes, immediate changes, would you, uh, would you seek to introduce? Um, I would start a recruitment drive to attract um, a different type of person into the BBC. I would try to get... Um, I would look for talented, bright young people, preferably not too middle class. Uh, 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 only a fraction of them would have come from through the uh, the, the Oxbridge Mill. Um, I would like to see I would like to see um, people with uh, minds of their own and um, who stood out from the general tide of woke opinion. So I would like, I would actively seek to recruit people who uh, were going to resist the groupthink in the BBC. That would be my priority. And I would instruct, I mean, <laughs> one thing I've often fantasized about it is that, is that um, what would be a very neat trick would be to uh, to get all BBC staff to fill out a questionnaire, which would detail their political allegiances, and um, and then I would uh, use that as evidence to reform the BBC. Now, there are a number of objections to this, as I'm sure you'll see, because Duncan, most of them wouldn't fill it out honestly, or if they did, you know, it, it would be a surprise. Yeah, I'm told that once upon a time there was a, a producer in Birmingham at Pebble Mill who actually instigated that very exercise and got a polling company to, um, to uh, test political opinion within the BBC. Now, the story may be apocryphal. I don't know. I mean, I was told it on good authority and it's, I've, I've heard it before, actually. I've heard it from a number of different sources. Anyway, needless to say, the results of that survey never saw the light of day because I suggest to you, they would have been deeply embarrassing for the BBC. Robin, thank you very much indeed for chatting to us today on TPA Talks. Really, really enjoyed having you with us. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you to Robin for an excellent uh, TPA talk. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And don't forget to like, comment and subscribe uh, and tune into the next uh, TPA talks.